I'm Kurt Benkert, and this is Pocket Presence, powered by Sleeper. Here we go. Happy New Year's, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Pocket Presence. We're all recovering. Some of us, early night sleep, just enjoying a Packers win. Others, having a great night with their Wisconsin buddies, drinking water to hydrate on set. I love it. Tyler, how are you on this beautiful first day of 2024? Good. I mean, a little behind the scenes for the listeners. We usually record these at about 10 a.m. We're recording this on New Year's at 2 p.m. And part of that was due to that Packers win last night. And we'll get into that. But go it, was, Paco, uh, it was a great way to start the year as a football fan in Green Bay. No doubt, dude. I, I actually, undisclosed, put the largest bet of my life on the Packers winning pregame. And it was nice not to have to sweat that one out. That was great. It just seems ridiculous. I got him at plus one. And it seems yeah. crazy to me that between a Jaron Hall, Nick Mullins style of game that the Packers wouldn't be favored. But yeah, yeah that's one that you, you you take the easy bet and you take you the just, You money. hammer it and you move on to next week. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But we, we got a lot to talk about. We do. And I, I want to start. You've been having a really interesting perspective on Twitter on, on this Lions-Cowboys uh, you know, two-point conversion debacle. We'll call it yeah. the, the Lions. Everybody knows the Lions got hosed by the refs. I yeah. like your perspective on this, given that maybe it wasn't a shoe in that they would have actually converted. The Lions would have actually converted the two point conversion if the refs had reported the eligible lineman correctly. But yeah. I mean, what do you make of this? We have now a couple of days to to decompress from all of this, but it seems like the consensus is the refs effed up. Yeah. And that's like been the theme this year, right? Like how many times have we hopped on here and talked about how bad the refs are? And I think at this point in time, like, look, there's a better way. I don't care what the better way looks like. I don't care how much extra time it takes. I don't care about TV programming. None of that shit. Just give us a better product. At the end of the day, do you not want parameters in place to get the call right, to make sure that things are done the right way? And that for me is the biggest problem in all of this is like, look, the refs messed up. There should be someone with higher authority. That's also just like a kind of like the concussion middleman where there's like they have no stake in this there should be an authorized higher authority that can chime in and say no stop this repeat this like the the red buzzer give me that red buzzer from above that fixes these egregious calls because i think the biggest part like look man the the lines shouldn't have been in that game at the end because if you look back to the tripping call that was missed they missed aiden hutchinson on a tripping call that would have put the cowboys like Would have ran more time off the clock, would have gave them probably a better chance at a touchdown on that last drive. Made it a two-score game. It is what it is. Mike McCarthy had some blunders with his time management, clock management. It isn't the first time, but didn't hear it here first. But I think at the end of the day, these refs need to be held accountable. They need to be better at their jobs. And the refs should not be allowed to influence the outcome of games. No matter right, wrong, and different, it it does not matter. Get the call right. That's your damn job. If you're going to miss a call, miss a call. If you're going to call the wrong call, don't effing do that. Like that's, that's in my opinion, if you miss things, you miss things, but don't call things that are wrong. And I don't know, man, the communication sucks. I think there needs to be just like in some of these other leagues, you have the ability to chime in and fix things. Like, do you not want at the end of the day, the outcome to be the right outcome? Because there's a lot at stake for everyone and home field advantage matters. Playoff seating matters. Like you're taking all this money in gambling sponsorships and you're not getting the calls right. That should be like, that should be a non-variable in these games. Like refing should not be a variable and it always will be if there's humans involved, but like get us down to as close of a small variance as possible in these guys and their jobs. Yeah. I think for me, when you look over the course of a game, you, you mentioned it, these refs are humans and they're going to make wrong calls. They're going to miss calls. And I think, and I'd be curious to hear your thought on this. It feels like over the course of a game that usually washes out, like the better team will win or the more deserving team will win. But what rubs yeah. everyone the wrong way and what becomes the most obvious is when at the end of a game, the game is on the line and then some obvious call gets blown. I mean, I think all the way back to when the saints got hosed out of going to the super bowl because yep. of an obvious hosed. pass interference call. Host. And I mean, that changes the trajectory of franchises, changes people's jobs. You, you mentioned yeah. the gambling implications. And it seems to me, I, I like your big red button idea, that there could just be some exception to this rule because it it seems like the NFL is just trying to layer consistency over the top of this, which is fair. You know, you want to have the same procedure for getting calls right and wrong all the time. But at the end of games, you have to get those right. And there have to. seems to be no willingness by the NFL to, to do anything different. Dude, and my thing is like, look, at least at least give us in the last four minutes this ability to fix the the things that 
by that point in time, okay, forget about all the things you missed early in the game. Forget about everything. In the last four minutes of football, give us your best absolute product, no matter what. Like, no matter how long it takes, is it going to take 10 extra minutes and run over? I don't care. We have overtime games that run over all week or run over any day of the week, right? Like, it's that's an ins- instance, but you can't have a game run over on TV slots due to getting it right. Like, that's that's the problem with me. And look, man, how many seasons this year would be different? The whole entire landscape of the NFL would be different if in the last four minutes, every single game had an accountability to make the play right. Like no ifs, ands, or buts. This entire landscape of the NFL with playoff seating, with brackets, who's in, who's out, would all be entirely different if there was a four-minute, all right, it's time to dial in. We got the eye in the sky. Nothing's getting missed, and nothing getting nothing is getting called wrong. I think everybody would love that. And I think less people would feel salty because then the conversation would be, look, okay, they missed some calls early in the game, but you had four minutes of crunch time to like go get it right and to go like win the game. Let that be the conversation versus what this conversation is every single week. And it's just, there's so much money at, at stake, dude. And like, there's so many people's jobs at stake. And like, these things start adding up over the course of the year. It all adds up. And man, don't let that be the reason why these games end up blowing at the end of it. I do think conversations like these are important to listen to because they're fighting this uphill battle about perception as you start pushing gambling money down into the league. It's the reason that gambling suspensions are so serious. It's the reason that players cannot place legal wagers on other sports while in the team facility because they do not want a misconception over, hey, we, you know, we players, we coaches, our officials are in bed with these gambling companies in any way. They they want to have that delineation be as clear cut as possible because you're right. This shouldn't be an entertainment product. It should be there. This is an objective outcome that can be wagered on. And a lot of money is at stake when you talk about this. And so if there is some mounting pressure, and it seems like there finally is, that these games are being influenced in a negative way and that the perception is like, hey, this really affects all the gambling money or it affects the credibility of the league as they're getting a bunch of gambling money. You know, my prediction would be for next year, there'd probably be some thing like you described, done where they want to get these calls right because they they have to keep fighting this perception that as gambling money comes in, their product isn't being corrupted in any way. Yeah, like just give us something that, like this shouldn't even be a conversation, right? Like, like the NBA doesn't have like a ref issue like this. Sometimes you get refs that like get arrogant and like they call technicals and eject people because their feelings are hurt. But like that's, that's kind of rare. Like the NFL has a real ref problem and they have, they at least have to do something because the inaction of all of this and just, ah, that's just the way it is. Like that is going to ruin the credibility of the league more than players placing bets on a basketball game in their facility that right. you're suspending them for a year for. Like right. that's how hypocritical is that? I agree. And I think the, to this idea of perception, you know, these, this crew was taken off of their playoff assignment. So there was some accountability had, but I don't know why the NFL just doesn't make it more public. They probably don't want to make a practice of absolutely lampooning their employees, but yeah. to a certain extent, when there's all this mounting criticism, you should probably send out a sacrificial lamb a time or two and be like, Hey, publicly, you know, I, I like the idea of having refs be accountable to media, you know, come out after a game and maybe the, the crew chief has to talk to the media. Dude, or I would the, love that. The NFL just making more that. of a, more of a stink or not trying to sweep this under the rug. Like they, they seem to, to be well, trying to it's, do. It's just like the chiefs game this past week. You had chiefs Bengals. They had Jake Browning who was getting hit as he was throwing, trying to throw it to the running back. He got hit and the ball came out a little weird and it landed like 10 yards from the running back. Running back was in the vicinity. They called it intentional grounding. And if you know statistically about sacks, intentional grounding, holdings, the chances of you scoring on a drive goes from like maybe 30, 40% to like 10%, 5% if you have a 10 yard penalty or more. Like statistically, the odds, like if you're talking about Vegas and the odds, the odds are being changed heavily in these games. And that was a must, must score drive and a must win game to stay alive for the playoffs. Everything that they did all year long came down to that moment that was, okay, maybe it's a 30% chance we score 40%. Oh, we're going to make it down to 5% now based on a call that went wrong. Like, And you have months and months of work and a whole year of preparation and offseason, all this stuff that comes down to this one moment that a ref blew a call. Why? When you, you need to swallow your pride as the NFL and come to the table and say, no, he missed it. No one's going to be mad at you or say anything for a ref missing a call if you're going to fix him missing it. It's real time. They're making judgment calls. They're not always going to be right. So stop pretending like they're going to be right all the time. That's my problem. Like, are you just too like egotistical or prideful that you, oh, they never miss a call. 
that that's my problem is like it's just it's stupid it's really stupid it's it's idiocracy i'm right there with you well speaking of ego we had another little story bubble up off the field this this week the panthers owner david tepper seemingly oh, throwing a drink at a fan's face so for those of you who haven't seen the video a jaguars fan turning around into the david tepper's box you know probably yelling some profanities at him or just giving him the business as the jaguars uh beat the panthers and tepper seems to take a a cup of water or whatever's in the cup and toss it at him and i mean kurt you have experience in the league. You know these owners have huge egos, but it seems like Tepper is quickly taking up the mantle of worst owner in the league now that Snyder is since gone. It's bad, dude. And I think like this is the problem that I've had while as a player. Like I had this, I hate, I hate wrongness. Like I really like my morality. Like just it, it drives me insane when things are morally wrong. And you have guys like this who think they're above people because of the money they have, like the lifestyle they live what they own whatever that they feel like they are above anyone and anything and then they're the ones who are in charge with like people like so many players right like so many of these players work their whole lives 15 10 20 years depending on where they when they started their career to get to this point in the nfl to then like your 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 like outcome of your career is going to be decided by these types of people and that's like that's just that's the way the nfl is and i know it's like it is what it is people getting paid million to play the sport but it's tough to swallow when your outcome of your life's work is being decided by people that are like that. And that's just the reality of the NFL. But someone like that has no right owning a team. Like, tell me, just because you have money doesn't mean you should be able to own an NFL team. You should have this, like, re- like what, protect the shield, they always say. Like, owners should have to protect the shield just like the players do, just like the coaches do, just like the commissioner. And it feels like because they're the ones with the money that the standard's lower – I mean, it's it's obviously a bad look, but it's not his first rodeo with those types of things. I saw all the stories came out about what he has been like and what he's done to people after that, threatening to buy the place and then fire someone because they didn't like his service at a restaurant, like stuff like that. It's like, dude, that stuff always comes back to get you no matter how much money you have. Do you think there's a time where this plays out and he kind of understands that being a meddling, hyper-involved owner just isn't a good thing for him. I, I know that is wishful thinking. Like somebody like Dan Snyder just ran yeah. an organization to the ground for 20 years and seemed to never learn the lesson. But you know, is there some hope for David Tepper to be like, okay, I'll get my, my rocks off for the next five years trying to, to make draft decisions and coaching decisions. Then I'll realize I should let somebody who knows about football actually handle all these things. I mean, I think at, at one, at some point he's either going to have to sell the team or he's just going to blow up in his face where he has no choice, but to hand it over. But something is most of these guys that buy these, these uh these teams right it's not their only thing it's not like their breadwinner they don't need it it's like a passion project so it's like might as well let him be the gm of a madden team what's he gonna do like he's just if he has all the money and this isn't a financial gain type deal he's gonna he's gonna make money no matter what when you buy an nfl team in today's market when you go to sell it five ten years from now it's gonna appreciate like it so in the meantime for him it's like I got a team in a really clean city. Charlotte's a great city to live. Like it's really favorable. Like I'm just going to kind of do what I want to do for the next five to 10 years, maybe sell it if I want to, if I want to make money, but this is a fun thing for him. And he's trying to prove to his billionaire buddies that he can be right in this lane of work. And it's clearly blowing up in his face. This is totally like a, who's got the bigger bank account type of play sure. in my opinion for him and he will ride this thing all the way until the ship sinks i agree and, and the way these things usually go i mean we see this across all sports you see the um, now las vegas athletics formerly the oakland athletics these owners can just cash in with media rights revenue distributions and they'll always have some sect of fans that will come and buy mm-hmm. tickets and merchandise and licensing like even though your team isn't good or we talked about the Panthers a couple of weeks ago, not even selling more than maybe 5,000 tickets to a game, yeah. that guy made a lot of money. And it's uh, yeah. it's always going to be something that makes him a lot of money, regardless of how competent he is or how into it he is. Yeah. And that's, that's the tough thing. Like you look at somebody like Bryce Young, dude, he put his whole entire life into this. And then he goes to a franchise number one overall. And you think the NFL is going to be something that it is not. And his NFL experience right now, dude, like, I feel bad for him because he doesn't even have a fighting chance and he doesn't have a fighting chance from the top down. It's, it's one thing when you got like a position coach that you don't really vibe with, or like even a coordinator, when you have an owner top down that like, that's tough to overcome because everything else funnels through him. And I don't know, man, it's, that is a, that's a situation that I would not want to be around. 
entirely. Totally understand. Totally understand. All right. Well, let's get to recapping some of these games quickly. We'll start with the most recent one first, the one we teased at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. The Packers, Jordan Love, and unfortunately Joe Barry all looked great on Sunday night against the Vikings. Kurt, I want to start here. Please tell me that Joe Barry did not just earn himself a contract extension by holding Nick Mullins and Jaron Hall to less than 20 points. I think what it's going to come down to is this week. That I don't think that game has anything to do with it. I think that game, more than anything, frustrates the shit out of you as a fan and as a coach on the staff and as a player because you deliberately saw them getting after Jaron Hall in the blitz game, in the coverages game, in like how much they pressed, how much they doubled the right people. There weren't easy completions on the field last night. And it's almost like, damn, it did not have to be this hard all year. And the annoying part is he didn't do that until he absolutely had to. They almost blew it against the Carolina Panthers last week, which would have definitely blew their playoff hopes, at least most of the way. And the tough part is like, you know that's in the bag, so why'd you wait till now? But at the same time, hey, we're here now. Like, we got to flip the page. Like, what are you going to do against Justin Fields? He's playing lights out football right now, elevating his team, and is a true threat in the run game. One, you can't give him free completions. And two, you got to try to confuse him in the blitz game, which they had success this week. We'll see if they can duplicate it. It's going to be a tall task for them. And I think that Joe Barry has to have his A game on just like he was this last week. And I think like he almost needs to like swear on the Bible that, hey, if you keep me as a coach, I will not play off coverage. I will not get freezy completions. Like I will do what I did against Minnesota. Like you you saw a Packers defense that was like not like really afraid of making a mistake or giving up a big play. They were like, all right, you want to take a shot on us? Cool. We're going to blitz you anyway. So like, what are you going to do? And like the way that they play offense is so complimentary to that, that that's the style they need to hone in on. And again, man, the only way I see Joe Barry like really keeping this job is if they crush it this week, maybe win one or two playoff games and like don't go down because of him. And it's just like a good exit. But um, that's obviously a tall ask because it has been a really ugly year defensively to watch, especially with how loaded that roster is. It reminds me of Arthur Smith on the offensive side of the ball. Got all these dudes, but what can you do with it? Yeah, you have a good game here and there, but like can't do it consistently. Like that's kind of how I look at Joe Barry. You got all these dudes, but like what are you going to do with it? And he hasn't done enough this year, but last night was a good step in the right direction. Yeah, Sunday, was, night. Well, Sunday night, the Packers back were against the wall. They were without Jair, without Eric Stokes, and Justin Jefferson still doesn't go for more than 60 yards. And so yeah. you don't even, you know, I think you make a great point. A lot of great playmakers on the defensive side of the ball for the Packers, but he even held a really stout receiving core to not a lot of yards mm-hmm. without those guys. And it's yep. just head scratching. Like, why haven't we been doing this the entire time? Uh, flipping to the other side of the ball now, Jordan Love looked great. A lot of really great resurfaced material from Vikings fans from oh, earlier dude, this uh, year when they were getting up, their man. laughs off. And now it looks like maybe Jordan Love regains the top spot as a quarterback in the NFC North. Is that too much to say? Or what, what are you liking about Love right now? Yeah, I, I love everything about how he's playing football. He is decisive. He knows the offense in and out. And the best thing that I'm seeing right now <clears throat> is that like there was this third down. I think I believe it was third down. It was either third down or it was a critical play. They were blitzing, so it was probably third down. And he had five or six seconds left on the play clock, goes to make a protection change. So he's like, he goes up the line, flipper, 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 meaning that the line slides, swap, and the running back's responsibility swaps. He got fooled on a pre-snap look, which happens all the time. You're, you're playing a 50-50 coin flip guessing game at quarterback a lot of the times in those exotic looks of who do you want to block who. So clock's ticking, ticking, flipper, flipper. <clears throat> then they give him the other look, and he's like, oh, shit. I messed it up, but he knew what the new problem he created was because the way that protections work, line slides one way, all, other side of the line is manned up, running back has typically help on the man side, then he wraps to help the slide side. That's like the base of their protection. Well, he created a free rusher because he got confused, knew that he had a free rusher as he's snapping the ball and knew that he wasn't going to be protected, drifted away, bought time and threw a dime downfield. And it's like how many rookie or young quarterbacks would just have been sacked or whatever, right? Like it's he's, and then all of that mental process to be delivering dimes. Like he's, he's slinging it off balance, off platform. It's just, he's playing as good a football as he could as really as anybody in the NFL is right now, maybe besides Lamar, but like in his own way, like I don't know if Jordan could play any better than he is right now. He's on fire. One thing I love about watching Jordan Love, and this is coming off of my entire life watching Aaron Rodgers, it seemed like near the end of Rodgers' career in Green Bay, he was getting a little 
protective over not wanting to throw interceptions. And so if something mm -hmm. wasn't there, he would just throw it away. And meanwhile, you, you see Jordan Love, like he's throwing out, you know, rolling left, throwing off his back foot, like just, ch just chucking these things yeah. 100 feet into the air and just hoping somebody's coming down with it. And as a fan, that's so much fun to watch. But it also seems like it's returning well onto the field. What do you make of that? decision to just let it, let it rip or being more like Rodgers in his later years where he was being a little protective with the football. Yeah, I think the way that they are going to win games is by taking those shots. <clears throat> and my philosophy on taking shots is, okay, what's the worst that can happen? It, it might get picked. Okay, like if you take calculated shots, though, you're either going to catch it. You're either going to probably get a PI. It's going to be incomplete. And like very rarely, unless it's a terrible ball, is going to be picked. And if it's incomplete, then you're going to let the defense know that you're going to take those shots regardless. And they have to play with that in the back of their mind when they come and react to play action or they come and try to fill in run gaps. The Packers are showing that they do not care and they're going to take shots. They're going to take them all day long and they're going to be aggressive. And that puts into the defense that like, look, we can't like slack off and just try to like bottle this offense up. We got to be ready for everything. And that allows for those three or four yard runs to be five and six yard runs, which add up over the course of the game, especially with the running backs the Packers have. Absolutely. Next week, the Packers have a win and in game. I'm getting flashbacks to last year where an already eliminated yeah. team, the Lions, keep the Packers out of the playoffs. What are you projecting for this game against Chicago? It seems like it's going to be a big one, not only for this season, but for the trajectory of this Packers franchise. Yeah, man, I would I would love to say that I think that the Packers are going to blow them out, right? Like I but I don't see that happening. I think this is going to be a true NFC North battle, everything on the line. And Justin Fields is playing really, really good football right now. And the Bears defense is a tough task. So I know the Packers are favored at this point in time, but man, it is going to be a down to the wire. In my opinion, I could see the Packers being down four on a game winning drive and needing to score a touchdown to win. Like I just, the matchup I don't like. I don't like the the Packers defense versus the way that the Bears play offense. Um, but again, I'm not going to put anything past Matt LaFleur having a great game plan, exploiting what they do. Like he's been on fire lately and deserves his his credit. Um, but I think it's not going to just be that easy this time. Um, but I hope the Packers win and I think they will win. I think they'll find a way. How do you yeah, look at this story? Pack yeah, sure, certainly would. I mean, how do you look at this Packers season? Let's say they win in Chicago next week. They make the playoffs. You know, first off, what do you think their prospects are like in the playoffs? And two, in what was widely considered to be a rebuilding year, we just want Jordan Love and some of these young guys to look good together. It seems like it's an overwhelming success, whether or not they win next week, although I know most Packer fans would like them to win. It's really interesting because I think, again, I think the Packers win and I think they make it into playoffs. And the way that the playoffs are situated right now, like I think the Packers are a team that people don't want to make the playoffs if they're already locked up, right? Like you have the Saints, Seahawks, Bucks, Packers, Falcons, like they're all bubble teams right now. Of those teams, the Packers are the last team that anybody wants to see in the playoffs. And <clears throat> you look at the Eagles, they're sliding right now. They're 11 and five, lost a lot in the last few games. They don't look like they're playing good football. They look super susceptible to like a defense that can be swarming and suffocating. And I don't think their offense scheme wise, like gives them a chance against some of these defenses they're going to play against. And then you look at the Rams and the Rams are nine and seven. And like in the Rams on a good day, our team, people don't want to play the Rams on a bad day. Like they had against the giants where Stafford throws two picks from overthrowing people. It's like, okay, they can, they can be gotten after. Um, those are the teams at the bottom that I'm like, I think the Packers are better than both of those. And I think the Packers, if they were to be able to play them would beat them. Now, if the Packers sneak into the playoffs, though, they'll probably sneak in as what the seventh seed most likely. Yes. They're going to probably have to go to Dallas. And if they don't go to Dallas because they're not the seventh, if they end up as the sixth and they go to Detroit, I think they can beat Detroit. They've already, they've already done it. They've done it recently. They did it on Thanksgiving in Detroit. But like once you get to playoff football, I don't think, I think records are out the window. It's like, who do we have available that day? What is the matchup? What's the game plan? What's the style of play? And right now, I think, I think the Packers have what it takes to beat somewhat convincingly or like not like have to like have a miracle everyone but the Cowboys and the 49ers so if they get in they kind of feel New York Giants Eli Manning going a little run like I kind of feel that out of them because they are playing really good football when it matters most yeah I don't know about other Packers fans but 
obviously we love the fact that the team won a Super Bowl in 2010, but it, the way they won that was also maybe the worst possible way as a fan that they could have, because yeah. you see a team that sneaks in the wild card, looks to be getting hot at the right time, makes sort of a miracle run and wins the Super Bowl. And so it happened a lot with Rodgers and now happening with, with Jordan Love and these Packers where you can convince yourself getting hot at the right time, a couple of favorable yep. matchups in the playoffs, and maybe you stumble your way into the Super Bowl. And <laughs> it's probably ridiculous, but that just sits in the back of your head because it's, you, you know, you've lived through it once before. Dude, you can definitely start like sipping that juice a little bit and seeing, you can see it. Like you can totally see it playing out that way. And the good teams right now that have been good all year are falling down the stretch. Like, again, do I think they go, if they go to the Super Bowl, are they going to beat the Ravens? Probably not. Right? Like probably not. But they are poised to go on a little bit of a run here, and I'm saddling up for it. I think it's going to be fun to watch. Awesome. Well, you brought up the Ravens. They are looking unstoppable. We sat here a couple weeks ago and talked about this huge matchup between the Ravens and the 49ers, and then we noted that the Ravens had a yeah. gauntlet against the Dolphins for what ended up being for the number one seed in the AFC. They look absolutely unstoppable. What were you seeing in this game that allowed the Ravens to put up 56 on a really good football team. Dude, the Ravens red zone offense, that is what it's all about. And I think it all comes down to Lamar and his skill set. What Lamar Jackson can do in the red zone is one, he can pass it out of empty. He can pass it out of play action. He can boot, he can sprint out, and he can run the ball himself, like power o, like zone read. He can do it all, right? As a defensive coordinator, which one do you try to stop? Because I've seen them in the red zone do all of that and score touchdowns. Like, if they get into the red zone, I would say their likelihood of scoring a touchdown is higher than any team in the league if they got to have it. The Ravens really haven't been in a got to have it situation much this year. But that is, in my opinion, their most powerful weapon. And he did it in the past game. He had some big plays to Flowers. He had a big play to Likely. The, thir the play that he had to Likely, dude, he was sliding left, throwing a crosser right, Lay, back leg was taken from the D end and just flicked it. Perfect one-handed catch up the sideline touchdown. Like he's becoming a excellent pocket passer. Pocket person, shout out. He is an excellent pocket passer, and that was that unlocks him to be MVP for the next five years. And he still has the ability with his legs. Obviously, he'll have that for a while, but he doesn't need his legs, and that's the most dangerous version of him. So, I mean. You're, they're playing Madden at this point, right? Like they're just playing Madden and they're divi oh, man. The Ravens are so good. They're so good. They're good. And they're an exciting team to watch because like you yeah. said, they can get you in so many ways and it's whether it's Lamar with his legs or now him developing and their into defense, dude, their yeah, defense, their defense is like, incredible too. <laughs> it goes like without what mentioning. their defense did to Tua. And again, like guys, everyone Tua was what MVP candidate for much of the year. Their defense, the way that they play it and the way that they keep everything in front of them, attack downhill, tip balls, like everybody is very ball aware. They're always punching at it, looking for it, whatever. It's they have the recipe. Like that is their their defense plus that offense. They can control the game if they need to. They can play from behind if they need to. They can do it all. And that's, in my opinion, what makes them a little more dangerous than the 49ers. The 49ers can control games and they can dominate. But if they get behind, it's tough. The Ravens can do everything. They just, if they take care of the football, don't turn it over. I don't know who's going to beat them. Let's flip over the Dolphins now. What do you make of this team who have still not beat the allegations of their inability to beat a good team? Yeah. They get blown out here and now it seems like they're limping into the playoffs and they might not even win their division where five weeks ago it looked like yeah. they were a lock for at least a two seed and now they might be slipping down to a wild card spot. Dude, in my opinion, this, this all comes down to the limitations of Tua. And it's not his fault that his defense is giving up a shit ton of points. But his play style is very much on time, in rhythm, accuracy, leading people. As soon as like Tyreek's not just running untouched down the sideline or they don't have the crossing route that hits on his first hitch. And you know what I mean? Like the off schedule for him is a little tougher than it is for some of these guys that are making plays consistently. And it, he looks uncomfortable in those situations more often than not. Like he's made some good plays off schedule, but... It's not where he wants to live. It's not what he does the best. And I don't know. In my opinion, man, it's they need to have a really, really good defense if they're going to do that. Um, if they don't have a really good defense, then who are they just going to blow out in the playoffs? You know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't think the recipe is there. Yeah, the issue of not being able to be good teams goes, it gets heightened when you reach the playoffs and every team is theoretically mm -hmm. a good team. Lamar seems to have locked up this MVP 
do you make these Ravens to be the Super Bowl favorite? I felt like last couple yeah. weeks we were talking about the 49ers, who can beat them? And now the Ravens have just gone and, and beaten two really good teams pretty yeah. handedly. Yeah, I think the Ravens are it, man. I think, I don't know who beats them. I think, honestly, I think the four, the way that the Ravens match up against the 49ers is not good. I don't think that that style of play is like what can scare the Ravens. I think they play very keep everything in front of you defense. Like this comes down to a defensive matchup for me where I actually think the one team that could beat the Ravens is the Cowboys. Um, mm-hmm. I think they're an explosive team and they have a defense that's got a chance to match with like turnovers and um, how like they're, they're aggressive on defense. They have DBs that will jump passes. They have DBs that will go get it. Uh, the Cowboys do. And they, they kind of took over that game against the Lions last week. I think, matchup wise in the NFL, the Cowboys are the team that match up the best in the NFC to give the Ravens a run for their money, but I still don't think they'd win. I'll throw a team out for you. And it seems like we have some of the best storylines in the playoffs this year, but Joe Flacco and the Browns yeah. coming to Baltimore and beating them with that really stout Browns defense. And if Joe Flacco yeah. can do enough with his arm, could the Browns possibly give the Ravens some trouble in the playoffs? I think they could. I think the, so actually I think the Browns are the only team in the AFC that match up against the Ravens. And again, they're NFC North. I mean, AFC North, they're built like that. Um, you're going to have to see Joe Flacco make the off schedule, weird, crumbling pocket, like perfect accuracy sideline throws. But their defense, again, is the only one that I see on that side that can give them a chance to be thwarted. I love that. I mean, talk about storylines galore in these playoffs. Yeah. Like you, you mentioned oh, the nuts. Packers and Mike McCarthy and the Cowboys. And on the other side, you could have Joe Flacco returning to beat the team you won a Super Bowl could with. You imagine? Like, we're getting spoiled right now. Dude, I, I love this shit so much. It's so much fun. It's, <laughs> it's so, so much good. fun. Okay, well, let's talk about a team that might not be as fun right now. I don't think their fans would certainly think they're <laughs> having a good time. The Eagles are oh. slipping at the absolute wrong time. And I, I'm, I don't have anything against the Eagles. It's just so fun to watch a fan base and a coaching staff and these p- players spiral oh, like the Roddy Eagles have the spiraled. Yeah, I know. Producer oh, Roddy is probably just funny. punching air at the moment. But their defense can't stop anything. The offense mm-hmm. looks lazy, boring, one-dimensional. And they have a lot of great guys. Like These are guys that were with them when they went to the Super Bowl just a year ago. So what is going wrong in Philadelphia right now? Dude, they're... They're relying so heavily on, we have better players than you. We're going to line up and just beat you. Mm. Like they're not being helped out by their scheme at all. Not to mention their defense is depleted with injuries. They don't have studs that can just like, you know, stop teams from scoring and four straight drives. They don't have that. So the offense, they need the offense to score points right now. And that's not been the recipe. So to not have this like gang green, like bully defense anymore, like what are they? And I would like to say they're frauds. And we've been kind of saying it for the past little bit, like the Eagles all year long, all of their wins were not convincing. Like, I don't know if they might have one or two convincing wins, if that, but like, it's kind of been like, yo, like you're, te- you have 10 wins or whatever now, but like all year long, it, they kind of feel like the Vikings were last year. Like you're not mm-hmm. as good as your record indicates. And now it's all coming to fruition right at the worst time possible. So again, What do they do? They get it right in the playoffs. Do they start, you know, switching up their motions and having better stuff going in that lane? Maybe, but I don't know, man. I'm not like, I'm not convinced at all. Um, I don't know who they go in, in a game in the playoffs in a must have it and beat right now. I don't think they beat the Rams. Uh, They might beat an NFC South team. Like that's about it. If you could pinpoint an issue with this team, I mentioned they have a lot of the same players that were on the Super Bowl roster but they lose obviously both their offensive and defensive coordinator. And now you have Sirianni sort of out here on what looks like an Island. It seems like a lot of blame is getting cast his way. So is this just a matter of the coordinators who stepped up aren't doing enough? Or is this a Sirianni issue? Is it a player issue maybe, but it just seems like on the surface, it wouldn't be that since they're just a year removed from making it. I think it's the coordinators, dude. I think you go look at the coordinators that they lost and what they're doing in other places and they're having success. And I don't know. I don't know how the guys that have their jobs now got their jobs. I'd have to do some research and digging, but that's the problem when you start like replacing guys with your boys. And mm-hmm. I don't know if they're his boys, but it doesn't look like they're like capable of calling games and putting their teams in the best chance or best positions to be successful. You can't watch their games and tell me that their offensive scheme is giving them the best chance with the players they have. So I, I will stand on that as a fact. Defensively. They're so wishy-washy. They've had some injuries. I'm going to give them a little bit more of a pass, but 
like offensively, you cannot look at film every single week for the amount of time that you watch film all around the league and think that, ah, our, our way of doing it gives us a good chance. You must have your eyes so far down in your game plan and your third and seven. We got to call this that like, I mean, the way that they handled the end of that game with their play calling was just like, nobody does that. Nobody would do that. That has any bit of confidence in play calling. And again, this is the problem though. In the NFL is like, Sometimes guys get jobs calling plays when they shouldn't, when they're just a damn good position coach. And right now, that's kind of what it looks like the Eagles have going on. They don't have good coordinators. It looks like they have good position coaches that were given coordinator jobs. And that's a downfall for a lot of head coaches because they hire within and like think that this guy's got the wherewithal to like navigate a game, and he just doesn't. But I don't know, man. Calling plays is hard. I, like I get that, but they're not giving themselves a fighting chance. I think a lot of Eagles fans wants to know, want to know what Nick Sirianni actually does. And it is an interesting trend that we've seen emerging in the NFL. I think Dan Campbell has now become the poster boy for this sort of yeah. motivational head coach. He doesn't, he's not responsible necessarily for the offensive or the defensive side of the ball. He's just the CEO of the team and a great yeah. figurehead. And that's the position that Sirianni is in too. Is there you know, something that you would <laughs> encourage Nick Sirianni to do more of or do less of, or is he just kind of a, a blabbering fool? Cause when, when they're good, he's you know funny and quirky and inspirational. And when they're bad, he just looks like he's not he doing nothing. a single thing on the sideline. Yeah. I think, dude, like I respect that role because I think it allows you to be sharper in in-game decision making, clock management, time management. But I think at some point in time you gotta you gotta pull the hammer down on the coordinators and be like, look, no, this is what we're gonna do. I need you to have this amount of plays in the red zone package because I saw this with this motion and this team did this. Let's steal it, copy it, flip it around, make it ours, and do this. Like and I don't know if he's already doing it, but it doesn't look like he is because the plays that they're calling right now, it's like, dude, we hope that we get into fourth and one so we can touch push. We hope we get down to the one yard line so we can guarantee a touchdown with touch push. Like they're relying on that. They're relying on leaning on people and, oh, we need a big play here. Go find AJ downfield. Like the, the, the high percentage plays for them don't exist. So they're just living and dying on big plays and hoping that they can dominate another opposing defensive line in the run game so they don't have to do anything. And it's vanilla, it's boring, and I just I think it looks lazy. Like there's a better way to do it. Clearly, other teams are doing it. So I don't know. Maybe be a little less lazy in your game planning throughout the week. We talked about storylines. One of my favorite to follow this weekend was the fact that Mason Crosby, the Packers' old kicker, mm-hmm. had a kick for the Giants against the Rams to give the Packers control of their own destiny, and it ended up happening anyway. But if Crosby would yeah. have kicked a 54 yarder to let the Giants beat the Rams, <laughs> the Packers would have had to win out to make the playoffs, which would have been just Chef's kiss, so perfect. But it seems like in all of that, you know, a struggling Giants team now led by Tyrod Taylor uh, put up a good, a good fight against a, a Rams team that is clinched a playoff berth. But I, I don't know how confident you can feel as a, as a Rams fan. What, what do you think? I think you can tell based on that day, who are they going to be? They mm-hmm. are lucky to have, not lucky, they're, they're, they have a good run game and they have a good run scheme and they have a good running back and they can rely on that more than they have been able to in the past. They, they don't have a dominant defense anymore. They don't have the guys all across the field, star-studded, that can just lock everybody down. So, like, they have to play better and cleaner football across the board, which if Stafford's going to have one of his two to three interception days that day, it's going to be a long day at the office. But if Stafford's going to be stellar Stafford and, like, hit every single throw and just elevate everybody around him, then they could beat anybody. So I think more so than anything, wh- which version of Matt Stafford are you going to get that day? because the Rams could beat anybody in the league. I'm convinced of that with who Stafford is, but they could also lose to anybody. So I think you need to watch your first quarter of what type of ball is Stafford playing, and you'll probably know by then. Do you think Puka has now locked in the offensive rookie of the year? It seems like maybe if Stroud hadn't gotten hurt for those couple of games, he was the shoe in, but I mean, rattling off these 100-yard games like they're nothing. It, it seems like he's locked in, but I, I don't know if you see somebody else that could give him a run for his money. I think it's got to be Puka. I think mainly because the odds were so stacked against him to get that and to be this type of guy this year you're backing up well you were allegedly backing up cooper cup but now you're you're wide receiver one in my opinion in their offense so it's not like uh you were a first round draft pick you were expected to be this guy so i think it's got to go to puka i think it would be a disservice for him to not win this okay we talked about the packers controlling their own destiny uh the steelers win over the seahawks allowed the packers to win out and make the playoffs george pickens has over a thousand yards this, this season with 56 catches. I mean, this Steelers team is befuddling. It seems like they were awful at the beginning of the year, but finding ways to win games. And now they're getting hot and still have a shot to make the playoffs. So 
what do you think is going to happen with the Steelers team come end of the year? There's been more conversation than ever of Mike Tomlin not retaining his job, but if he gets them to nine, 10 wins, like it looks like he's going to, yeah, it's a hard case to fire him. I don't think you can fire him because he's had some QB ish stuff going on all year. Like I think, I think what they need is they need to bring in some guys. Um, I think Mason Rudolph's kind of shown that he can play ball in their style of ball, but I don't know. I feel like they're, they're a generational type quarterback, like, like ceiling wise. And I don't like, maybe it's Justin Fields, right? Maybe you sell the house to get Justin Fields and bring him into that offense. Cause I think he could dominate if the bears are even willing to let Justin Fields go. But I think they need, again, nothing against Mason Rudolph. He's played lights out and he's elevated that team and he's got him like in playoff contention, but they're a guy away from being a force with the receivers they have, with the run game they have, the defense they have, they're very close. Um, and I think with all the injuries across the board, guys missing many weeks, not knowing which quarterback's going to play. Obviously, in my opinion, Kenny Pickett's not the answer, like at all. Trubisky has never been the answer ever. Like they should clean house, either bring in a stud quarterback or someone like Russell Wilson, even that's like probably going to elevate you slightly more than Mason Rudolph, or get a young guy in the draft that you think has the highest ceiling possible. Let Mason Rudolph run the beginning part of the year, but like. They're, in my opinion, that's that's what they're missing, right? Like, the Ravens, they have Lamar. The Bengals, they have Burrow. The Browns have Joe Flacco, but they have Deshaun <laughs> Watson. Like, they got guys. I think the Steelers need a guy. Um, and that, with how the rest of their team plays, could be what sends them over the top and gets them back into being a Ravens-Steelers consideration versus a Ravens-Bengals consideration every year. Sure. So let's talk about the future of three teams now. You mentioned the Steelers. Uh, the Seahawks I want to touch on. And then you threw in the Bears with a Justin Fields conversation there that I think is interesting to have. So to touch on the Steelers first, Mike Tomlin has now gone 17 seasons without a losing record. My friend Frank Michael Smith, who uh, creates great sports content online, huge Steelers fan, talked about on a, on a podcast recently how, sure, that's great, but the goal isn't to win nine games every year. And they haven't, the Steelers haven't won a playoff game in the last seven years. And especially in a franchise like in Pittsburgh where the expectation is championships. It's a green Bay type franchise where the expectation is is. championships. Like you're not hanging banners for nine win seasons and it's an impressive (laughs) streak and, you know, shows Tomlin's consistency, but is he, does he need to leave to get them over the top? Or like you said, are they kind of fighting an uphill battle in other spots within the roster? I think they're fighting an uphill battle with the roster more than anything. And I think if he were to go somewhere else, he'd probably have more success than that. He reminds me of a Dan Campbell type coach in his own way, where like guys will just ride for him. He's got the best interest of the guys, finds ways to put guys into situations that have them successful most of the time, right? Like if he were to go somewhere like Chicago or I don't know, man, like even the chargers, like I think that he would elevate them with their rosters. Like he's If you look at his roster across the board, wide receiver one, as of two games ago, George Pickens running back one, Najee Harris and quarterback one, Mason Rudolph. Then you go look at like LA QB one, Herbert RB one, Eckler wide receiver one, Allen, like, he has not been graced with the best roster. And I don't know if, I don't really know their dynamics there. I don't know if he is pseudo GM as well, like drafting people. I know he's got a say in it probably, but um, they need some splashes in free agency or really need to nail the draft because they're slowly losing that battle over time against, you know, you got Jamar Chase with the Bengals, T Higgins there, Burrow, Mixon, like stack them up roster by roster. And he's doing really well. So you, you brought up an interesting, you threw something interesting in where Justin Fields could, potentially go to the Steelers I think as we watch this Packers Bears game there's a conversation now to be had of you return Justin Fields as a quarterback for the Bears do you send him somewhere else they just locked in the first overall pick by way of Mm -hmm. the Carolina Panthers so they have their pick of the litter of a you know really impressive quarterback class what do you do as a Chicago Bears GM when it comes to the head coach and now the quarterback which seems like is not so obvious of a decision man I I've thought a lot about this and I've seen a lot of different takes back and forth. Like Justin Fields has shown you that he can be a franchise quarterback. So you're just going to let one walk away where like, okay, go get yourself a generational talent of a receiver Harrison, and then give Justin Fields another year in an offense that he's already comfortable in. Give him more weapons. Give yourself a fighting chance. Your defense is growing like everything in Chicago regardless of how this weekend goes is pointing in the right direction for them. 
And you're going to, if you trade Justin Fields, you're going to set your franchise back three to five years, years to let a rookie quarterback develop. Like you might not get a CJ Stroud who's ready year one, you know, one in the hand, two in the bush type of deal. I don't think Mm -hmm. you can let him walk away. And I don't think you can be so enamored by these draft picks. Like your window to win is now as a coach. Cause if not, you're you're not gonna have a job. So I don't think if they're staying around as the coaching staff that they can be willing or even the GM, if you have a shit team for three to five years, the GM, you're out. So you know that right now, next year, Justin Fields gives you the best chance to compete and he can be a damn good player. Go get him a few more guys. Like go, go put your effort in there because if you walk away, if you let him walk away or trade him away, who's to say you're going to get like, what are you going to get Kirk cousins and free agency maybe? And then what? Like, you know what I mean? Like who's the, who's the guy that's going to go in and elevate them? Well, I suppose I the counterpoint know. the counterpoint is Caleb Williams, right? They, they, they yeah, hold not, the first overall pick, so that it, he's there he, for the taking. But he couldn't I, do it at USC. You know what I mean? Fair, like fair. He he couldn't do it at USC and USC talent wise with Lincoln Riley has like they got dudes on offense. And then you go and look at Link you go look at USC in their bowl game and the freshman quarterback throws for six touchdowns or whatever and wins you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. you get a guy like Caleb Williams. and again, I think Caleb Williams has great talent, but he's got a learning curve. Everyone in that offense is learning curve. Baker Mayfield had one. Kyler Murray had one. Took them two to three years and they're out. If you go get Caleb Williams with a number one overall pick, like maybe you do have a roster that can kind of help him like curtail that a little bit and speed it up. But I just think that is such a big risk that you're going to like, I don't know. I think trade back, trade back or just say F it. We're taking a receiver number one overall because he is a generational talent at receiver. Marvin Mm -hmm. Harrison Jr. is a stud. And you look at guys like Justin Jefferson, should Justin Jefferson have been number one overall in his draft class? I think nobody would complain about that now. So go give yourself a chance. Sure. One more team I want to touch on quickly. The Seahawks with this loss now only have a 27% chance of making the playoffs. What does this team do next year? They have a similar type coach to Mike Tomlin, who's a defensive minded guy, been there for a while, had success, but now the Geno Smith shine has began to rub off a little bit and they just kind of seem like a a 500 team that used to make a move as well. Yeah, dude. I think that some, sometimes things like that in the league, in my opinion, they just overstay their welcome a little bit, or just, it's just kind of time for a change. And I think right now in Seattle, it's time for a change. And that is nothing against Pete Carroll. He's done a great job his whole career, right? Like he's led them to places that they haven't been before, but I think right now, what is it looking like in that division? And do you think that Pete Carroll can lead you against Shanahan every single year and for the next five to 10 years? Like you got to start thinking five to 10 years down the line because right now the 49ers have a franchise quarterback that's on a rookie deal still. And Mm -hmm. they have all the pieces to do this for the next three to four years. Do you think Pete Carroll right now, given the results that he's given the last few years, will suddenly change in the next three to five to compete with the 49ers year in and year out? I don't think so. I think you need to take a gamble on a coach that's like, like from that Shanahan tree to see if you can bring them in and go change things and how it's done. Because Seahawks offense is very like still, in my opinion, one dimensional vertical down. And I don't know if they're doing it the best way. Their defense is like, again, like run of the mill. They're like an eight, eight team. Right. So if I was them, I would be looking like, okay, where can we go find that next young stud offensive coordinator as the head coach? because that's what we're going to need to compete in this division for the next five to 10 years. And I think that's like Houston Texans, Bobby Slowick, to be honest. That's, that's who I'm looking at. I'm like, if he could do that in year one with CJ Stroud, like he came from that scheme. He knows the 49ers inside and out. You need an inside job to be able to compete at this point in time with the 49ers. So go get somebody that knows them inside and out has gone somewhere else and had success because then you might give yourself a fighting chance to have like a Mike McDaniel type story where the AFC East isn't just so free anymore for the taking. So that is what I would do. And I don't think that's like off the wall. I think that again, there are one or two more losses this year away from it being a sure fired. He's gone. So I just think rip the bandit off. All right. One more point of recap. It's not a week in the NFL without worrying about the chiefs. They only go for one touchdown and six field goals this week. Still clinch a playoff spot. Now have some ridiculous streak, only second to the Patriots of winning their division. But how are you feeling about this Chiefs team as they head into the the playoffs? 
I think the Chiefs for the one time in their like existence in the past 10 years, like they have a defense that can do it like by themselves or damn near by themselves. Their defense is really good. Now, the question marks, in my opinion, watching the game, I think Travis Kelsey looks hurt. He looked hurt for the past two months. He doesn't have the same burst. Travis Kelsey is going to have to live in the scramble play and finding the open space to be effective. What does that mean? They're going to have to use their other tight ends more on normal downs and have Kelsey more on third downs. And like, that's just going to be what it is. I think they need to get rice to be their wide receiver one and feed him as such and take shots with him downfield as such, because the, the chiefs can't sustain drives consistently going four to eight yards a pop, which they've tried to do all year. They need the spark plays. They need the 40 yard, 50 yard plays that get them in the red zone. So they can start having their playmakers make plays creatively, but they've got to find an identity on offense and look, they have it locked up. Probably not going to play much this week. If I was them, I'd, I'd try to play my offense and be like riskier. Try to this week. Mm. You don't need to win. Go see if there's something you haven't tried. That's a little riskier that works. And I think that's what they got to do this week to find some sort of an identity because in the AFC against who they're going to have to play against in the playoffs, you don't want to have to live in that defensive battle, especially when you're not going to have home games the whole way through. Yeah, I'm actually curious to hear your thoughts about this because this week coming up, we have the Ravens, the Niners, already locked in the one seed, so they're likely not going to play their starters, which means that for the next two weeks, these teams are not going to be playing football. You get the age-old rest versus rust debate, but what does it really look like inside these buildings when you don't play football for two weeks and then the next time you play is in the divisional round of the playoffs? Yeah, I think I don't think it's about rest as much as it is don't lose that edge of the mentality when you strap it back up. I think rest at this point in the year is a God's gift to these teams if they use it the right way. Like when I was with the Packers in 21, we had the first round by and then we lost. First round or second round exit, first round by. We came out like tiptoeing, in my opinion, in play style, play calling, aggressiveness across the board, whatever you want to call it no one's fault in particular, but it was just like, we expected uh, the game to go easy and us just to like win it. In my opinion, we felt like we were the better team and we were, we found a way to lose that game. And I think if you can take advantage of the two weeks of rest, you get double by week. Basically you get all of your guys with like the knees and the shoulders and the nicks and bruises, like get them at a hundred percent, but know that you're going to take charge as the coach and aggressively calling plays like not trying to tiptoe your way back into a game. That's what it takes. Cannot tiptoe around after a bye. These games where you're resting starters, our coaches just going total vanilla. They're putting the second string guys in there and they're like, you know, we're probably going to lose this game, whatever. Or are you trying to maintain some edge in competition and be like, you know, we're going to play this like, we're yeah. going to call this like a regular game just with our second string guys. Yeah, um, I think you call it like a regular game with your second string guys because there is that anxiety, like the human anxiety of being a coach and like, ah. Oh, like, we know we got the buy. We can't blow it. Like, it's a little more added pressure in a sense. You trade off pressure for being a little healthier. But, yeah, I mean, every team does it a little differently. But I do think it's important for guys to at least go through their pregame routine. Like, strap it up and maybe just not play. But, um, I don't know. Everybody has a different philosophy. Both sides, all different ways have worked in the past. But I think it comes down to, like, what's your mentality as a team? And, like, are you sure of who you are? Like, do you feel that imposter syndrome creeping in? Like maybe you're the one seed and you don't think you really deserved it. I think the two teams this year that are the one seeds know they should be the one seeds. Yeah, I completely agree. We do have a really great matchup, however, between the Dolphins and the Bills and it's basically the AFC East title game here. So with yep. a Bills win, I believe they secure, I think they can be as high as a two seed, which is absolutely insane Crazy. given five weeks ago, it looked like they were out of the playoffs. And then the Dolphins obviously reeling, they beat the Cowboys, but got blown up by the Ravens. We could really use this win to head into the playoffs. So yep. what are you looking for in this game? And Primarily, how do we get these Dolphins back on track? Oh, man, the Dolphins, well, they got a defense that they're going up against this week that has played good of late but has had holes, Um, and I think they can match up decently against them. They can exploit it. Um, I would say I think for the Dolphins right now, they've got to establish the run, and they got to do it in a fashion that, like, I mean, they have got to have Achan go off. They have got to have Mostert back and getting five to six yards a pop. And they have got to be a team that can take over the game in the run game and doesn't need Tyreek to go crazy. Because in my opinion, like the smart, the smart and like feel good thing for them is like, hey, Tyreek is the cherry on the top. He's the guy that draws coverage, but he pops for a 50, 60 yarder from time to time. Like the Dolphins need to live in the run game being their, their baby. And just really haven't been able to do it consistently lately. Sure. Another fun game that we have, a win and end game 
the Texans and the Colts, two teams where maybe in week two or three, you weren't projecting that yeah. they'd be vying for a playoff spot. But here we are. Who do you have and what are the keys for each of these teams if they want to make a little push into the playoffs here? Man, well, I think that the Texans need some help, right? Colts need some help. I think the Texans are a little bit more on the outside looking in than the Colts are just record wise. But man, if I was a if I was any of the other AFC teams, like I'm looking at the Texans as a team I don't really want to play in the AFC South. CJ Stroud's got to go crazy. And I think the the toughest thing is like CJ Stroud going crazy rested a lot on his rookie on his rookie receiver, right? Like Tank Dell was a stud this year and he doesn't have that like over the top crazy catch guy that somehow finds a way to make him more often than not. It's got to be a little more precise up and down the field with Nico Collins and those guys, but um I just don't think either of them are poised for a run at this point. So I don't know, man. I think they're both just going to be, if they, if, if either of them makes it, they're just gonna be happy to be there. In my opinion, totally. I don't, I don't think either of them is fit for a run. One of the seasons where the fans are like, you know what? I'm happy. Like even the team that loses, you're yeah. happy that you were in contention until the very last week and you can sell yourself on a great <laughs> upcoming season. Yeah. Both those teams, I feel like in the last few years have had a, a rough stretch. So like, Hey, take the wins where you can get them go get ready for the draft and the combine. And then like, look to next year, because I think both of them could rival the Jaguars. Like the Jaguars on paper have the guys, but they're not playing like it. And Trevor Lawrence, in my opinion, is like, he's sliding, dude. I don't know if he's the answer long-term. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he's probably gonna be paid like it or is paid like it, whatever, but I watch him play and I just don't see it. Like I see some it plays, but my opinion of him has changed over the course of the year because he's made a lot of mistakes that like, not even backup guys should be making time management, game understanding, when to do this, when to do that. And I just don't, I don't see it out of him. So unless something, those are typically things that get shaken out with reps. He's had a shit ton of reps. Like those are not things, like if it's not fixed now, was it going to take him five years to fix that? I don't know. Right. A, a division that has a lot of, or a, a division that has a lot of really interesting young quarterbacks. And even when you throw Will Levis in there with the Texas or the Titans, it's uh it should be a fun one for years to come, uh, yep. which is always nice to see, especially in a division that has not always been the best. Lastly totally. here, Kurt, the Eagles are locked into the fifth seed, which I think if you were to told them that uh, a couple weeks ago, that would have been a disappointment. Dude. But here they are. <laughs> Get your take on this, the rust versus rust debate back into the fold. But there's an added layer on it, which is they're playing at MetLife Stadium, which is notably some of the worst turf in the field when it comes to injury. It's obviously where Aaron Rodgers ruptured his Achilles. I do have a bit of science for you on like what is going on here. So they use something called slit film turf, which if you picture what it looks like, it's basically a blade of grass that's broken into like four strands and all four of those strands are connected with little loops. And so it's as easy as you think where as players are running around, their cleats get caught in these little loops, which increase the likelihood of lower body non-contact injuries, things like ruptured Achilles and torn ACLs. Science is what you're saying. And so yeah, the NFL PA and the NFL have collaborated on studies on these, and it shows unequivocally that artificial turf is more dangerous wow. and slit foam turf was used in a majority of fields. They're now moving away from it, fortunately, places like uh, Ford Field and Detroit. Uh, the, the Colts are moving away from it after this year. I think even the MetLife is moving away from it after this year just because they know it's so dangerous, but they've kept it around for so long. They, um, they, they stood on that hill for a while too. That's, they that's did. crazy. And what was interesting was, so they have this, all this data back until from like 2022 back until like 2012. So take 10 years of data to show that there are more injuries that happen on artificial turf than on real grass. And then what happened in 2021, and this is just an anomaly or an outlier, Mm -hmm. uh, they, the, the, the injury rates between grass and artificial turf were virtually the same. And so the NFL basically took that one year in 2022. One year. goes on this huge PR campaign and they basically, Uh. they they give a bunch of non-answers where it's like, well, there are some artificial turf fields that are safer than natural grass, natural grass fields and some natural grass fields that are safer than artificial turf fields, which is probably true. Like, I'm sure you played on a lot of really shitty real grass fields. Yeah. But at the same time, the science is pretty undeniable. But they used it as their, um, you know, as their PR campaign for 2021. That's... And then the next year in 2022, there was the biggest injury disparity that there had been in the last eight years. And so it's just like in a ball don't lie just kind blew of blew up in their face, basically. Totally blew up in their face. So that's just wild, dude. It like, is. That's... So I, I, I want to get your take. Like, is this something that goes through a player's head or goes through an organization's head when it comes to the Eagles? Like, hey, we're we're locked in here. You can talk about rest versus rust, but also guys get injured on this field a lot. So maybe that's another reason we don't want to have them play. Yeah, it is actually. So earlier in the year, uh, David Bakhtiari with the Packers, he was dealing with a knee injury, obviously that has mm-hmm. been lingering for a while, and 
it is known to you'll have more inflammation after the game from a turf game. And like, that's just a thing. You'll have more inflammation throughout the week. If you practice on turf, there's a reason why teams have grass practice fields and not turf practice fields, because that's where you spend most of your time. Coaches even do coaches complain about, Oh, my back hurts been standing on this turf all all day, like in walkthroughs. And it's like, if you have coaches that are not moving, complaining about their backs hurting from standing on turf over concrete, like imagine players putting like tons of G forces into the, on the grass, stopping, Mm -hmm. turning, like, the wear and tear over the course of the year, like on turf, dude, it's just, it's a longer turnaround. It hurts more. It's just your joints don't thank you for doing anything on turf. And if I'm, dude, if I'm the Eagles, I'm like, dude, I'm already turning my head to playoffs. I'm like, all right, what do we got to do? We already lose in our home playoff game, most likely. Like, doubt the Cowboys lose. I don't know, man. Is like, is the risk worth worth the reward when like that stadium has claimed seasons this year? I don't know. Totally. I, don't, I think pride wise, the last thing you want to do is go on a. You look at the flip coin, dude. Flip side of it. Do you want to go on a skid, like a deep skid, hanging like, yeah, commander or what? Who they lose to? They lost to uh, the Cardinals. They need Cardinals. to get right game badly. Yeah, the Cardinals, and then lose to the Giants heading into playoffs, feeling like not confident at all. I don't think they I don't think they can afford it actually this time. So I'm gonna say they do play I think they play to win, hmm. but they're gonna feel it next week. And I hope they don't have any casualties because that would suck. Yeah, that's so interesting. I never heard the perspective of even coaches complaining about just standing on it. Because oh, really dude. at the end of the day, it's like this is a little oversimplified, but it's a concrete slab that has a couple layers of fake grass on it. And so you're not you're not getting the cushion of like dirt and you know yeah. the real stuff. You're well, dude, just, you're playing on yeah. a hard surface. Have you ever played basketball on concrete versus hardwood? Yeah, of course. Like, like concrete sucks and your joints yeah. hurt, your knees hurt. Like probably can't walk barely after it. If you haven't played basketball for a while, we're on hardwood. It's a little more forgiving. It's the same thing. It is the same thing. The interesting thing about MetLife, I just was doing a whole deep dive into yeah. this recently, is that um, so they, they will be switching to what is called monofilament turf, which is basically how it sounds, where instead of the blades being these woven blades where you can get you know caught up in, uh, they're just single blades of grass, which we're probably used for different durability and cost reasons yeah. i'd imagine um definitely but cost th- reasons yeah this whole idea of switching it to natural grass i, I assume you fall on that side but um mm-hmm. there's a really maybe sad reality which is the owners are the ones that decide at the end of the day and the amount of money these stadiums make by being able to have a college football game on a saturday a concert on a friday and then an nfl game on a sat on a sunday couldn't happen if it was real grass. You don't see Lambeau yeah. Field having concerts in the middle of the season, right? No. And I mean, let's let's be honest here. Like, what's this all about? It's about the money and it's about mm-hmm. the convenience and the bottom line. And at the end of the day, most people that own these stadiums are multi-billionaires, not many, many millionaires. Most of them are billionaires. What's a couple million dollars at the end of the day, bottom line, when if you look at what you're saving injury-wise over the course of a few seasons alone on player contracts probably not, not even, you know what I mean? Like that's mm-hmm. look at Aaron Rodgers' contract. How much more money would you have made in ticket sales or whatever? Had he not gotten hurt on that stadium? Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think it's a very short sighted vision financially for them to keep pushing this off. Yeah. I think that's a tipping point to all of it. And you've seen a lot of injuries this year and quarterback injuries specifically this year where yeah. you have a lot of backup quarterbacks playing and I can't imagine the networks are happy. I can't imagine the league is happy yeah. with, how many replacement level players are are in the game. And so it seems like maybe we kind of get to that end point slowly. And again, it all happens yeah. very quietly. Like, you know, Indianapolis is switching over their turf at the end of the year and it's not front page news, but it is really significant when it comes to the players. It is. And I think the last part, part of this that I want to say is like, the, everything affects something. And if your players are out, right, you look at look at ratings. These teams get paid based on ratings for the next deal, the next negotiated deal. Then you start getting clauses about injuries. Then you get Russell Wilson benched because of an injury clause, right? Like, wouldn't be shocked if at some point in time there's clauses in revenue splits for TV deals. Like, that's this stuff is like real. Like, if a company, like if a company like CBS or whatever, you know, whoever has the rights to a game on a Monday or Sunday night football, they're going to, whoever pays who the dollars and sponsor dollars or rights, right, to the NFL, if they're paying, we'll throw out a number, $100 million for this game. Let's say it's that Monday night football game early in the year, Aaron Rodgers versus Josh Allen. Say it was a hundred million dollars, just round number. You cannot tell me that the next time they go to negotiate something 
and they have to get Zach Wilson versus Josh Allen, that they'd be openly willing to taking on that risk of paying a hundred million for the same exact product or for a different product, right? Like that's business. So at some point in time, there's going to be negotiations back and forth on this. And I think that's though, that is when the grass conversation will change. Totally. And you've already saw, you've seen iterations of that broadcast conversation you, you just talked about where they can now flex every single primetime game. And if, yeah. a, you know, a, a Jets are in primetime late in the season, they can say, oh, sorry, you're out now. And, um, yep. you know, teams have less of a notice to play on a Thursday night or a Monday night or a Sunday night, whenever it may be. But there are yeah, so many uh, dynamics and all this, dude. It's it's so webby, like everything's intertwined. It is. And the people that win at the end of the day, the, the most interesting thing to me always is that the power structure in the NFL or any professional sports league is owner and then league. It's not like Roger Goodell has control over all these guys. All 32 of these owners have their Roger Goodell's boss and they're the ones that are responsible for resigning his contract and mm-hmm. the ones that are, decide his pay raises. And so it's... he is beholden to them at the end of the day. And the players, I think of the NFL, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, like do a pretty effective job unionizing. It seems like the players have a pretty strong union, but at the end of the yeah. day, they're always advocating for themselves. They're never the ones directing where or what should happen. Yeah, it's definitely not the NBA. Um, yeah, right. I think that's part of like playing in a uniform with a helmet behind a jersey and all that, where mm-hmm. the NBA, it's their faces out and like their emotions are more like you are always behind the team and you're always behind the shield. And I think the players advocate where they can, but it's also like your lifespan in the NFL and how replaceable you are versus other sports is a lot different. And it takes the top guys in their prime at the right time and willing to step up and say something to get real change done. And it's just, it's, it's a really tough dynamic of power struggle between owners, players. Like you see guys like Aaron Rodgers fighting for the players or fighting for different things, like because he has the platform to do that. But in two years, that platform is going to be gone, right? Three years, whatever it is for him to be the voice that can sway things. And it might already be gone now, right? Like it's, it's got to be somebody like Pat Mahomes, but is he willing to step up and like say something that's like so egregious, right? Like rubbing the owners that are paying him half a billion dollars. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes you just stay in your lane and like let these problems go to the next generation. And I think that's kind of what it is. This comes down to just a very simple employer versus employee type of relationship. And I'm assuming most people that listen to this have a job and you think about how difficult it would be to go to your boss and advocate. What are you willing to, what are you willing to do, man? Like yeah, for exactly. something that won't probably change in your career span exactly. for most of these guys. Exactly. Well, all that said, there still is a lot of really great action going on this week. The games mm-hmm. are exciting. We have a couple teams sitting out. We'll see how it plays out. I, I'm curious on your Eagles prediction, if they'll actually play or not. It seems like they need to get back on track. I think but, they have to play, right? Like they have yeah. to. If they If they lose this game again, they would have to start second and third string only to have an excuse to lose this mm-hmm. game. So. I completely agree. It would be. I feel like for the fans of Philadelphia, that would be sort of a coward's way out, where they're like cutting yeah. their losses, and and I'm not sure they're in the business right now of, of cutting their losses as a team. But in any case, if you want to get some skin in the game, Sleeper is offering a $500 deposit match on your first deposit with code Kurt K U R T. 500 bucks is pretty big, and they this last weekend had a uh, a free or a protected $30 or up to $30 bet, which yep. is that's always fun because you're I mean you're literally playing with house money at that point and it's like risk free baby it. yeah risk free those are the risk best free. when you're uh you're, you're winning you have all the upside and none of the downside so keep an eye out code kurt for up to 500 bucks on your first deposit it's Let's just get getting it. good here kurt we are all oh, dude we're just in the beginning playoff ball is right around the corner thank you for another banger episode i'm excited can't wait to see the uh the line set on the sleeper picks and what do we got this week it's gonna be a weird one got some backups playing got some games that don't mean anything but i think there's gonna be some diamonds in the rough here but Until next time, new episode will be dropping on Friday. New schedule alert, Tuesdays and Fridays. Enjoy. We'll see you guys next time.